University of Management and Technology, UMT, I welcome you all to the launching session of Dr. Hassan Sway Murad Shaheed Memorial Lecture Series. This series is initiated with a pioneering spirit to reflect the legacy of Dr. Saab of catapulting and transcending human minds above the ordinary with the objective to make the world a better place. It is deeply humbling honor for me to host today's event, which has been arranged to pay tribute to visionary, our mentor and founding father of UMT, Dr. Hassan Sway Murasa. We have launched this annual memorial lecture series to carry forward the legacy of learning and leading as professed and envisioned by Dr. Saab, who was a true larger than life personality. And as we know him, he is a personality to be revered, respected, and stays in our hearts with us all the time. Continuing his legacy, uh, in this series, we'll be inviting personalities who have hit the epitome of success and have seen it all and done it all in their lifetimes. And they have made tremendous social impact in the world at large and created numerous uh, scenarios whereby humanity has benefited. We will be enlightened by their insightful thoughts, enabling us to make seamless transition into the future with clarity and conviction. Today's changing world is creating new challenges to manage, and we need to find solutions by listening to the people of eminence who are in the thick of the game and working out solutions of moving forward in this vulnerable, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times, as we call it, VUCA times, pretty volatile. Moving forward, uh, to pay tribute to Dr. Sensu Murasa, I would like to uh, give a abridged biography of him. Dr. Saab, as we all know him, he was a charismatic reformist, an admired leader, and a visionary par excellence. He was a catalyst of change, a guiding light who defined, who defied the traditional academic and corporate milieu by setting up benchmarks and innovation being the central seat in his thoughts. He was a scholarly teacher, a man of letters, an avid researcher, and distinguished educationist. He left indelible mark and touched thousands of lives with his towering intellect, philanthropic activities, and groundbreaking ideas. He was a person of conviction and a person of conscience. Under his orchestration, UMT has emerged as one of the leading academic center and an island of excellence with over 25,000 students 700 faculty, more than 200 PhD scholars, and a lot of other scholars of eminence who are there to take UMT uh, in chasing and following of the vision as said by Dr. Sanjay Murasa. It was due to his untiring efforts that UMT today ranks among top 500 in QS rankings and 400 plus in world for societal impact by the Times Higher Education UK, and the ranking is improving every day due to the continuous effort applied by all the faculty and the, and, and the administration of UMT. His tenure as rector of UMT and later chairman of ILM Trust exemplifies his overwhelming love for academia and societal considerations. To summarize, uh, in his words, he used to say, we are in a moral struggle to create collective measurable societal impact to serve humanity. And that is only possible through learning and leading with passion to serve. So this is the legacy he left behind. And this is where we all trying to come to terms with and make it happen. Dr. Saab has left a proud legacy for, for youth and contemporaries to emulate, and his legacy will continue to inspire his ardent followers now and forever. 
At this point, I would like to play a short video of Dr. Sensu Murad Saab, whereby we'll walk you through his remarkable journey of life with tremendous achievements and contributions. So I would request to please run the video. It's five minutes video. Give you flavor of Dr. Sensu. एक उस्ताद की हैसियत में देखें एक आंट अपने और की हैसियत से देखें एक दाई की हैसियत से देखें वो एक नजरियाती इंसान थे उनका एक ग्लोबल इंटरनेशनल पर्सपेक्टिव था प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर हसन सुहेल मुराद जो हैं वो एक एहसास शख्सियत है दुनियावी तौर पे अगर आप कहना चाहें तो मैंने शायद इतना हार्ड वर्किंग शख्स नहीं देखा वो वर्ड्स ही नहीं है कि हम उनको कंक्लूड कर सकें परफेक्ट फादर एनीवन कुड एवर विश फॉर कि वो जो आम रबश जिस पे सब चल रहे हैं उससे हट के कौन रिया रास्ता बनाता है कौन मिसाल बनता है कौन लोगों को नई राह दिखाता है हसन सुहे मुराद वो थे नई राह दिखाने वाले एक नई रबश दिखाने वाले ये सोचती हूँ कि जो स्पिरिचुअलिटी जो थी उनके अंदर मेनी पीपल माइट नॉट बी नोइंग अबाउट इट दैट वाज द बेस एंड कोर ऑफ हिज पर्सनालिटी व्हिच गेव हिम स्ट्रेंथ थ्रू आउट द डे ये सवाल कि ये सब क्यों ये बिल्डिंग ये इदारा ये मस्जिद ये लोग ये सब क्यों वो सब कुछ करते हुए उसके जहन में सिर्फ एक ही चीज होती थी और वो ये कि उसको एक दिन अपने रब से मिलना है जो उनका ख्वाब था वो ये था कि अच्छी तालीम जो है वो हर किसी के लिए मैसर हो उनको किसी चीज़ का शौक नहीं था सिर्फ वो एक बहुत ही तालीम दोस्त इंसान थे इसलिए उनकी लाइब्रेरी जो थी उसमें तकरीबन दस हजार किताबें थी तो उन्होंने ग्लोबल लेवल का करिकुलम जो है खुद जो है घंटों लगा के दिनों लगा के डिज़ाइन किया वो इस नतीजे पर पहुंच गए थे कि कौमों की जो तमीर है वो तालीम के बगैर मुमकिन नहीं है कि भाई आबिद मैं ना एक इदारा बनाना चाहता हूँ जिसको इल्म कहा गया या आई एल एम कहा गया अलिफ लाम मीम कहा गया और इस तरह सोलह जून उन्नीस सौ नब्बे को इस इदारे की बुनियाद रखी गई यू एम टी की जो उन्होंने बुनियाद रखी वो उन्होंने इसलिए नहीं रखी कि वो उससे पैसा कमाना चाहते थे उन्होंने एजुकेशन को जब भी मेरी उनसे डिस्कशन होती थी तो वो इस बात पे पैशनेटली बिलीव करते थे कि एजुकेशन से प्रॉफिट बनाने के लिए नहीं होनी चाहिए एजुकेशन हमें अपने यूथ को ट्रेन करने के लिए उन्हें मुस्तकबिल के लिए तैयार करने के लिए एजुकेशन जो है होनी चाहिए आ, वो इस्लामी अखलाकी अकदार की तरवीज और उस पर लोगों की तरबियत करना चाहते थे वो उनमें से थे जो इस्लामिक रनासांस देखते थे थ्रू एजुकेशन और वो कर रहे थे उस तो मंजिल तो पाकिस्तान की तामीर थी ये माशरे की इस्लामी माशरे की तश्ल थी लेकिन इल्म के जरिए और फिर दूसरा काम लीडर्स करते हैं कि खाबों की ताबीर भी अपने सामने देखते हैं यू एम पी उन खाबों की ताबीर साठ बरस में दुनिया ने हसन सहेब को जो कुछ दिया वो एक यू एम टी की शक्ल में छः सौ बरस का काम बल्कि उससे कहीं ज़्यादा का बड़ा काम करके चले गए मुझे याद है अभी तक तो हसन की मुस्कराहट याद है मुझे यकीन नहीं है अभी तक तो इस बात पे नहीं है कि हसन चले गए बिछड़ गए मुस्कराहटे बखेरते हसन चमकदार मोतियों की वो कतार नहीं है हर कोई उनकी मुस्कुराहट को मिस करता है कि जब भी हमने उनको देखा है वो हमेशा ही वाज ऑलवेज स्माइलिंग इफ डॉक्टर मुराद वर हियर टुडे ही वुड बी चैलेंजिंग अस विद गुड ह्यूमर बट स्टिल चैलेंजिंग अस टू फाइट द गुड फाइट टू बी इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स ऑफ पीस विद जस्टिस इन अ ट्रबल्ड वर्ल्ड इन माय हार्ट एंड इन द हार्ट्स एंड माइंड्स ऑफ काउंटलेस इंडिविजुअल्स अराउंड द वर्ल्ड he will forever be remembered as a pioneer in bringing the world to a better place the umt ko qs asian university ranking mein top 500 universities mein shamil
कर लिया गया है इसी फाउंडेशन में हम इस अदारे को आगे लेके चलेंगे और हमारा जो मेन गोल है कि हम एक हाई क्वालिटी ह्यूमन रिसोर्स प्रोवाइड करें मुल्क को कौम को एक चीज़ जो उनकी ज़िंदगी से सीखने की है ये है कि आपकी कमाई वो नहीं है जो आपकी आमदन है आपकी असल कमाई वो है कि जो आप लोगों के काम आए और जो आप लोगों के साथ नेकियाँ करें उनके साथ भलाई करें शख्सियत है मिस्टर सेंड आउट रिक्वेस्टेड एज फॉर फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक फॉर हिज प्रेयर्स सो सिंस आवर नेक्स्ट चैप्टर इज अबाउट हिम सो वील जस्ट टेक फाइव मिनट्स ब्रेक द मोमेंट ही गेट्स बैक विल रीडिशिएट द सेशन प्लीज थैंक यू Faisal bin Karachi will you please confirm uh, whether Hussain Daud Saab is back and he's online so that we move to the next step All right I got the message is back uh, All right So, uh, our keynote speaker today is Mr. Hussain Daud Saab, and it gives me immense pleasure to announce that we are initiating this journey by a very distinctive, globally renowned personality of eminence, whose credentials and achievements cannot be described in short span of time. I received copious amount of papers, and uh, but we can only highlight some of his uh, things. But before formally handing over forum to our keynote speaker, I would like to give a brief introduction about him. Honorable Mr. Sen Daud is chairman of Daud Hercules, a family-owned group of business with rich history spanning over a century. Under his dynamic leadership, he has driven the group and investments with a vision of purpose to serve the nation. Today, the group is recognized as one of the most diversified conglomerates. in pakistan under the stewardship of mr daud engro has emerged as a partner of choice for international companies mr daud also chairs the board of trustees for the daud foundation he is the founder and chairman of board of governors of prachi school of business and leadership he is on board for, mr daud is also on board for teach the world foundation aiming to address the challenge of illiteracy through technology based on self learning he is an active member of world economic forum since 1992 for his contributions for improving international business relations he was conferred national award by the republic of italy in 2008 he holds mba from kellogg university and he is a graduate in metallurgy from sheffield university uk so i would like to request all of you to please welcome hosen daud saab he is the pride of pakistan to to give his keynote speech and we are here sir to learn from you and to take insights over to you send out saps assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thank you very much indeed for your introduction and for inviting me to address this august audience and i hope that i am able to share with you some of my experiences so that perhaps some of you may have uh, some takeaways which may be of some value to you i would like to start off this discussion first of all <clears throat> by just giving a, a brief background about my relationship with uh, Dr. Hassan Shah Murad. He joined our group, and he was really attached to me as a financial analyst. And he assisted me at that time in developing the feasibility report for the expansion of the Dawood Hercules Fertilizer Project. 
In 1990, he set up the Institute of Leadership and Management, along with his father. And he was an individual who started with really nothing. But in a short period of time of his life, he has created an incredible institution uh, in the UMT, the ILM, being uh, graduated and became the UMT, and has become an absolutely remarkable success story. And I would like to, to share, I think, that he and I really had the same approach to leadership. And therefore, I feel honored that I may be actually uh, sharing with you the same frame of reference that has brought about the degree of success that he has had, and a little bit about the degree of success that I have had the privilege to have enjoyed. When my father died in 2002, we had a group with a turnover at that time of just short of 3 billion rupees. Today, the turnover of our group is 226 billion rupees. It's about 76 times growth. I started off in 1968 when I joined the world of work or as I call it, the great university of life. And at that time, as you know, by 1971, we had lost East Pakistan. 1972, we experienced nationalization. Our group at that time, which has achieved its zenith in 1967, when it was a group of which employed 35,000 people, and I had a value at that time of a quarter of a billion dollars. That group lost half its assets in East Pakistan and the remaining assets in West, West Pakistan, half of them were nationalized. So while I was born into a position of privilege where people would look at me and say, well, you were born with a golden spoon, you had everything going for you. I just wanted to set the context to explain that, you know, Allah Ta'ala, in his infinite wisdom, challenges all of us. It doesn't matter what is your birth. What does matter is the tests that you will be facing and how you overcome them. And in that process, how you're able to develop your leadership capabilities so that you can help the nation develop, I'm in the air, uh, obviously in the corporate sector. Dr. Hassan was in the education sector. But I consider his achievements as important, if not more important than mine. So at that time, in 1971, after we lost to Pakistan and in 72 we nationalized, naturally there, were, there was a, an environment which is extremely anti-private sector. And in that, private, in that environment, it led to a creation of conflicts within the family about the way forward. Because we, were being, we felt that we were being really um, attacked from all sides. Family, family discord obviously took place and it took quite some time in order to resolve those. However, in, 19, in 2002, my father passed away and I had to assume the responsibilities that he had bequeathed. At that time, we were in a difficult situation and we had to develop the fundamental base of, of the business so that we could grow. And as I have explained to you, that by the grace of God, after 18 years, we were able to grow 76 times. But what I want to share with you is my learnings on the issue of leadership. The title we have today is of course, Learning and Leadership. So 
so what I'd like to share with you is the practical side that I have experienced. And I hope that you would be able to appreciate or take away some of the learnings for your own to improve your own situations in life. Basically, what is leadership? Is it an inborn characteristic? My answer to that is no, it's not inborn. It is something that can be learned. It is something that can be acquired. But there is a process. And the process starts by, first of all, develop leading yourself. If you can't lead yourself, the chances of you being able to lead others in a manner which would benefit them as well as yourself is significantly diminished. So you have to lead yourself. But how do you lead? Well, I will give you what in the, in the um, vernacular of the world today is a sort of a formula. First of all, you've got to realize that the most important part of leadership is what is the time dimension that you're addressing? Is it the next five years, 10 years, or is it a lifetime? If it's a lifetime, then naturally your appreciation and your ability to learn will be totally different from if you have a short time frame like five years. So early on I adopted the first and most important variable was that this is for a lifetime. Then I realized that in order to be able to address all the tests and challenges that I was undergoing, it was only possible if I could ensure consistency. Consistency of what? Consistency of decision making. All of us make decisions. I have the same weaknesses that all of you have. I was at that time a person who had a lack of self-confidence, a person who had fears, a person who was daunted by the challenges in front of me, a person who was significantly affected in terms of the influences that were around him and the challenges that were thrown at me by all the various events and occurrences that took place. So like everybody else, I too was struggling. Looking back, I realized that some of the fundamental decisions I made about leadership, but the first of all, I had to develop a sense of humility. And in doing so, there had to be a methodology, a way of going forward. I realized that decision-making was the key. Every decision has a double accountability. It has an accountability an instant accountability to yourself immediately, and it also has an accountability on the Day of Judgment. Because you have to accept the fundamental principle that we all have to die. And when we die, we will be held accountable. There are no free, free lunches in life. There has to be accountability. And without accountability, then you have immature behavior, that you can make any decision you like because there's no accountability. So accountability is fundamental to success. And it's accountability that drives us to improve. So first of all, I decided that I have, to, accepting the principle of accountability, I said that the best way to go forward was to make decisions which were consistent. In other words, each succeeding decision would be supporting the previous decision. And if I could go through life making these type of decisions with each new decision 
supporting the previous decisions, then my probability of achieving would be higher than it would be if I kept changing the direction. In other words, I make a decision and then maybe several decisions later, I make a decision which reverses the previous decisions. So consistency of decision making is very important. And to me, it's quite obvious that a person who is consistent in his decision making is, will definitely succeed, whereas uh, as compared to a person who does not make this consistent decisions. So how do you inform, uh, how do you ensure consistent decisions? Well, you have to realize that decision making is not just in the business world, it is in all aspects of life. It's to do with family, it's to do with friends, it's to do with society, it's to do with the country. It has to be in totality. So you need to have an, a framework which will allow you to make consistent decisions. So what is that framework that will allow you to make consistent decisions no matter what your occupation is in life? First of all, it's a realization that each one of us is responsible for our own development. Each one of us strives for self-actualization. And it is that desire which motivates us to face the tests and the difficulties that come along the journey of life to be able to overcome them and overcome them successfully. And to realize that every time we are successful in overcoming a certain test, then we are that much stronger to face the next test. But it is those tests will help us to grow, without which there's no way that you can grow. A life of ease does not go well for those who wish to self-actualize. So therefore, one should have an attitude, a positive attitude to welcome those tests, but in the process, never give in. Never give in what? Never give in so that you result in making inconsistent decisions. So how do you ensure the inconsistent decisions? I realized that for me, you know, I'm not an intellectual, but I'm a practical person. And so I decided that I would go to the source of knowledge, that's the Holy Quran, which is the book of wisdom. All other writings by humankind are books of knowledge. The Quran is a book of wisdom. So I thought to myself, why shouldn't I go to the Quran, go to the, go to the one that really matters and try to learn whatever I can from that. And what did I learn? I learned to develop a frame of reference which allowed me to make consistent decisions. And what was that? It is a fact that you have to ex accept certain fundamentals. Those fundamentals are that you have to speak the truth. Always speak the truth. No matter what the losses are, you have to speak the truth. And always identify with the truth. So, that's the first decision, fundamental decision I made. I made a decision that I'm always going to speak the truth. And I'm not going to vary from that, no matter what my losses are. With that, I was able to then free my creative mind to concentrating on how best to address challenges. Because if you are inconsistent, you are not able to give all of your energy to overcoming the challenges that confront you. So having made that decision, I realized that, first of all, I have to develop myself. 
So the first thing we learn in life about leadership, what we learn is leading oneself. First of all, developing ourselves. And if you don't have the habit of speaking truthfully to yourself, then how will you speak truthfully to others? Because you can't, you can't pretend that you don't know that you're speaking untruths. You know. So I would advise that every one of us in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror and say, can I trust you? Do you speak the truth? Do you speak the truth consistently? Without variation. So that is the beginning of leadership in my mind. Second thing that I learned was honoring commitments. And this is what we're told in the Quran. Honor your commitments. And that is a difficult task. Even today, I suffer a lot on that account because, for example, I'm usually quite late in going to a, 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 an event or a, a social event or whatever. And I try all the time to improve. So long as I keep trying, I'm not defeated. I'm not a failure. I may fail, but I'm not a failure. There's a large difference between the two. So I keep failing, but I won't give in. Failure only comes when you accept that you have failed. So long as you don't accept that you fail, well, each failing gives you the ability to learn more because we learn by failing and not by success. So these are very important development uh, phases that you go through. So, we are realized that commitment to oneself, and many of all of us try to change ourselves. We try to make commitments and we fail at them. But if we don't accept them as, as a failure, we're still in the game. We can keep trying to improve. So commitment is the next important point. When you have both of those, it leads to a situation of having trust in oneself. And if you have trust in oneself, then you have secured a very important achievement. Why is that so important? It's because it really, really builds up your self-confidence. I have yet to come across anybody with supreme self-confidence. I think my father's quite like that, but I don't need to achieve supreme self-confidence. Because if you have supreme self-confidence, I feel that it will actually retard oneself. Because you will not then consider these challenges and these difficulties and these tests as, as your stepping stones for further self-actualization. Once you have got, been able to develop this within yourself, then you go to the next stage which is called leading others. When you lead others, that is when you have the capacity to multiply yourself through organization. And this is what Dr. Hassan Murad did. He was able to get together a team a team of people who identified with him, identified with what he was doing. And he was able to consult them and make decisions. And the, the, all the multiple decisions he made has resulted in the outstanding achievements that he has left, he's bequeathed the world. So that's what I try to do too. So I like to consult. 
when I consult others, I'm very, very insistent upon the fact that they give me what they think and not what they think I want to hear. For example, I did invite uh, quali uh, uh, qualified people to join the board of Engro. And I was asked by that director, am I allowed to uh, give you my view openly, candidly? I said, if you don't give me a view candidly, you're no use to me. I'll find somebody else. So in my approach is I encourage all board members, all uh, others who interact with me to speak candidly, to speak openly, without fear, in total security. And I say to them, the most you can do is make a mistake. And then you learn from that. But for me, mistakes are divine tests. It's a nice way to learn. So that, what does that mean? It means that I as a leader, when I'm leading others, I'm actually encouraging them to develop themselves by expressing themselves. And we learn from the body, from each other. So we start to grow. And when your team grows and understands and starts to think at a high level, the contribution and the quality that they are able to contribute dramatically increases. And so, really, the success that we've had in Engro and in, in the group, which is 76 times growth in revenue, is entirely based on the team. It's not based on me. It's the team that was able to bring about this type of growth. And if you look at the life of the Holy Prophet, he too developed a team, a team of like-minded people whom he developed and allowed to speak with candor. And so therefore was able to make decisions. And you see the results of that. Th their results, which have never been equaled in the history of the world. So we see now that leading others requires the fact that the leader has to trust his team and the team members have to trust the leader. When does that trust come? Only when you speak the truth and when you honor your commitments. So that they, every member knows there is a sense of security all around them and they can speak and participate and take ownership wholeheartedly. So that means we go from leading self to leading others. And then when you've led others, then you start to lead organizations. Now, in Engro, for example, we have very uh, developed governance structure. What is governance structure? What is the relevance of it? The relevance of it is that you define the processes by which decisions are made. And through the governance structure, you're able to delegate authority, which is commensurate with responsibility. And there is the principle of accountability. And on top of that, there is, there is a principle of reward and compensation. So everybody feels empowered to make a decision. Everybody feels that they're not going to be overridden by the boss just because the boss has a different attitude, a different concept in mind. What is that concept? That concept is what we today are really struggling with in our country. It is a concept of control. Control is a very negative attitude. What it does, it restricts human development, it restricts performance, it restricts uh, quality achievements. So therefore, 
I never exercise control. I instead endeavor to empower others to make decisions. I never sign a check in my life. I'm not responsible. I'm at the board level. In our organization, the board has no executive authority. The executive authority belongs to the chief executive and his team. And there's nobody in the board that can override them individually. The board can only override them collectively. So the chief executive has the confidence that he can make decisions and he can lead the enterprise without having the board constantly looking over his shoulder, but rather the board empowers him and therefore he performs with great confidence and he can make decisions and deliver the results. So we're very clear in our organization. I have no executive authority at all. And I ensure that the board never ever gets involved in any form of executive decision making. The job of the board is to ensure values, is to ensure that the DNA of the, of the organization, the culture is based on those values. Is to, is to determine the direction of, of growth. It is, to, it is to mandate the strategy that management will develop. It is to give its, its decision on major investment uh, commit, uh, commitments to investments. It is to promote, it is to identify and appoint the chief executive. It is to delegate and empower the chief executive to perform. It is to set the key, the key performance criteria for the chief executive to perform. And it is to ensure that there's a governance structure which would, which would actually monitor how decisions are made within the organization each, in the, each level making decisions within the framework that has been specified. Those are the responsibilities of the board, and that's all we do. The management, on the other hand, is responsible for delivering the results. And the management is responsible for what I call the operational side of business. In other words, they make all the operating decisions. And those operating decisions then reflected in an income statement. And at the end of the year, that income statement is the basis in which the board then makes decisions about the allocation of the funds of the profits that are made. Okay. If I was to apply the same concept to the individual, the individual is making operating uh, uh, decisions. All of us are. As we go down life's highway, we're making operating decisions. So in some form, it's like a, having an income statement. What happens is that those are accumulated into a balance sheet. And the balance sheet is our soul. So as we make decisions, which are operational in nature, those decisions will either add value to our soul or subtract value. So the principle of accountability is instant. As you make decisions, so you will either benefit your soul or you will retard its development. And it's in all aspects of life, not just in the business world. And so you see how the soul develops. And when it develops, that's where you get self-actualization as your whole, the ethos of your whole personality rises, as you make consistent decisions. And consistent decisions, I already told you, is based on values. It's not based on what I get. It's based on my values. And always making decisions which 
are, all, are fundamentally for the benefit of all rather than for benefit of self. And to hold self accountable for that. And then you develop your reputation. It's that reputation which is truly the wealth that you have earned. Look at the fantastic uh, accolades that are stated for the, in the Kaivya Azam, both from those who are detractors as well as those who are supporters. Outstanding. Wouldn't one more like, I like that? When one is fa uh, uh, facing death at the final days, one then says, really? Was I able to develop a reputation? Because that's what you're going to take away with you. And that's what you're going to leave behind. All the other worldly things are irrelevant. So this approach also helps you to get a balance in your life of the importance or the unimportance of worldly things. And instead, it gives you a sense of harmony, a sense of peace within yourself. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that is what matters. But we may never forget that we are, after all, imperfect. And we will make mistakes. And as I said to you, mistakes are blessings. That's all I've implemented in my life. That's all I've tried to do. Always keeping to my values inviolably, never tell lies, never take advantage, and always think for the benefit of all. And this is exactly what Dr. Hassan Murad did. And therefore, I, f I feel his, his, his presence, which I know that he followed the same principle. For he could not have achieved what he had achieved without that in my opinion. So we realize it is a frame of uh, reference that matters. The frame of reference is the foundation of consistent decision making. It's been such a privilege to share my experiences in my life with you. I'm truly grateful for you, to you for giving me the time and for inviting me to be the speaker at this first memorial talk on, uh, for Dr. Hassan Sarag Morad. I'm grateful to all of you for being so, uh, for being so gracious and, and honoring me by your presence. Thank you so much. Stop. Thank you, sir, for your great enlightening talks. And I hope that the audience got a lot of food for thought and point supporters. And uh, if I may take the liberty and the courage to try and summarize some of your points, uh, we need to focus on a framework, a mental framework, a decision-making framework which is based on two different balance sheets. One is your personal balance sheet, whereby your asset side is your honesty, truthfulness. And on the negative side is your obligations, liabilities in your personality. We need to minimize them and increase our asset base that will help us in having enhanced creativity. And then on the financial side, the sum total of all the decisions which you take during your organizational management processes gets reflected in an income statement and balance sheet, which tells you the net impact of your decisions. But the process to get the right financial results and uh, to get the best personal results, they're pretty well integrated and your decision-making matters. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your great enlightening talks. And uh, it was the best mentoring session I had in last so many years. Thank you very much, sir.
Uh, moving forward now, I would like to invite Mr. Ibrahim Hassan Murad, President UMT RM Trust, for the vote of thanks to extend gratitude to Mr. Hussein Daud on behalf of entire UMT. The words that he has spoken, they are not only mentoring on the management side, but also he has told us the different dimensions of uh, Dr. Hassan Sweb Murad, for which we are grateful. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Ibrahim Hassan Murad, sir. Please. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Hussain Daud for uh, accepting this invitation to be the keynote speaker for today's event. Uh, this is the first memorial, Dr. Sansoy Murad Memorial uh, Lecture Series. And I was thinking of who to invite. And then the first name that came to my mind, that was of Mr. Hussain Daud. And the reason for that was that uh, Dr. Hassan was a teacher of teachers. And Mr. Hussain Daud was someone who he learned a lot from. So I wanted to take his perspective and his ideas and uh, wanted him to share his you know, thoughts with the audience, with the deans, with the directors, with the UMT family, community, our friends and family. And indeed, it was extremely enlightening to hear his thoughts. And he speaks with such poise and calm. And it's, uh, you know, his, even his voice is very soothing to the ear. And you can listen to his ideas, uh, you know, the way he uh, talks. You can listen to it for us. Uh, so once again, I take this opportunity to extend my profound thanks to our keynote speaker, Mr. Sam Daud. Um, for, his, for us, his leadership at the Daud Foundation, DH and Engro is a role model. These giant entities have left indelible marks upon the corporate sector of our country. We certainly benefited from the knowledge, experience and remarkable leadership of Mr. Daud. The relationship between Dr. Hassan and Mr. Daud has historic roots. That Dr. Hassan, as I mentioned before, was deeply inspired by him to the extent that you, he used to quote him in the workplace and often at our home. So we, you know, we knew, we acknowledged that Dr. Hassan, he, didn't, he wasn't impressed with a lot of people. But Mr. Hussain Daud was someone who he was greatly, greatly impressed by. So <clears throat> not only that, there's another uh, reason why, uh, you know, I asked, uh, requested Mr. Hussain Daud to be the uh, inaugural speaker for the first uh, memorial uh, Dr. Hassan Murad lecture. So Dr. Hassan only worked at one place as a full-time employee in his life. And it was DH, and that was under Mr. Hussain Daud's patronage and leadership. He was his only boss. That tells a lot about the relationship between Mr. Daud and Dr. Hassan. A remarkable anecdote, I was remembering this uh, a few days ago. Uh, Dr. Hassan told me that once his uh, contract, you know, of his employment contract was uh, about to finish, he he requested Mr. Daud, he told him that if you want, I will work for you for one additional month without any remuneration. Because during my stay at your you know, organization, I may have sometimes you know, not worked to my fullest potential, or I may not have delivered you know, up to your expectations. So I will work with you for one month without any remuneration just to make sure that you as my you know, boss are satisfied. So this you know, level of transparency, honesty, and God-fearing behavior is what we all need to include, adopt in our lives. Following in the footsteps of the great philanthropist, Mr. Daud, Dr. Hassan thought of establishing an institute that developed effective leaders and competent managers in all walks of life 
while ensuring the highest standards of quality. And even the idea for ILM, Dr. Hassan used to tell me that he shared, he got this idea while he was working at DH. And he thought, why not, you know, create an institute that develops future leaders and the people who are extremely competent, they, are, they have the skill and they have also have the knowledge. And he shared it with Mr. Hussain Daud initially. And um, Mr. Hussain Daud from the inception supported this idea. And later he also joined our board. Today we see the results of his endeavor in UMT, which is now one of the leading universities in Pakistan. And through ILM fund, which is now Pakistan's largest scholarship program that has granted about 5 billion rupees in scholarships to around 13,000 students from across Pakistan. Today's event is not a glorification of the founder of an institution. It is a day of remembrance in the name of a man who formulated our scholastic parentage. It is a day to pledge allegiance to his ideals, humility, empathy, intellectual growth, service, and patriotism. We resolve that we will continue to emulate his vision in our quest for knowledge and social betterment. Again, I thank Hussein Daud for gracing the equation. In the end, we pray for our beloved Dr. Hassan. May Allah bless his soul and grant him the highest station in paradise. May Allah grant us wisdom to emulate his character in our thoughts and actions. Pakistan Zandabad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saint Daud Saab, and thank you, Brahim Murad Saab, for your time and blessing this occasion and uh, letting us have a great launch of this annual memorial series, whereby we'll be having, inshallah, a lot more sessions like this, and we'll be inviting the eminent people like Hussein Daud Saab, who has made tremendous societal impact in Pakistan and uh, otherwise in other countries also, likewise, Dr. Hassan Sui Murad Saab. And uh, philanthropy is common to both. And uh, uh, the contribution which uh, uh, Anger Corporation and the Allied companies have made in uh, empowering women in remote areas where people had no hope is remarkable, incredible, and full praiseworthy. And it needs, uh, you know, second words to, I mean, I don't find any words to praise those initiatives whereby they gave hope to the hopeless and who had no hope, who lost all the hope actually. So thank you very much. And in the end, the best way to pay tribute to Dr. Hassan Sway Murad is by holding true the values he embodied and enshrined. And by standing tall in front of challenges and move forward, move towards human progress with agility and determination. This is the age of agility and determination. We need to fight it out this VUCA time and we need to move forward. Thank you very much, everyone, for you being a wonderful audience. And inshallah, we'll catch up with you in the next session. Till then, stay safe and Allah Hafiz. After this, please proceed for dinner. It's uh, served outside for your convenience. Thank you very much. <laughs>